So just to quickly, I know that this will save you time if you want these resources for your ministry or for yourself or discipleship. Uh, that's great. If not, that's great too. So I just wanted to really quickly uh, talk about it. First of all, if you want to be put on the email mailing list, this will just let you know when I'm going to be speaking in your area. And uh, Debbie will let you know that along with any new books that come out. And we do, Lord willing, hope to have uh, Ephesians ready by the end of this year. So, uh, And next after that, Lord willing, will be the Sermon on the Mountain. And I'm not sure uh, what will come out. I have several I've written that haven't been published yet. So we're just... Um, waiting to see. The first one, as Nikki mentioned, was with the Master in the School of Tested Faith. And if you don't know anything about my studies, um, they're written in expository fashion, which just basically means verse by verse through books of the Bible. I cover the entire book verse by verse, explain its meaning, a little bit like of what you heard last night, with application and illustration for women. And um, then at the end of every chapter, there are study questions, there's a memory verse, and there are application questions. So this one's on James. The second one that came out was with the Master on Our Knees. This is a look at uh, prayers in the Old and New Testament. Um, uh, there's also two chapters in here on fasting and praying. I believe this is something that we as uh, New Testament Christians um, don't do. You know, Jesus didn't say if you fast, he says when you fast. And so I look at every instance in the, in the scriptures on when God's people fasted and prayed, and in every instance, God intervened, except in the case of David with Bathsheba. As we know, God already told him, uh, you will not die, but the child will die. David fasted and prayed for seven days, but the child did die because God's a, not a liar. And um, so that's a little bit different in that book, but we, it is verse by verse. I, I cover the prayer of Jehoshaphat. I cover the prayer of Solomon for wisdom. A lot of the Old Testament prayers, a lot of the New Testament prayers. The third one, a uh, Bible study that came out was with the master is fullness of joy, which is on Philippians, again, written in the same fashion as the other ones. And then the one that came out, I think it's it's a year, been over a year now, is with the Master in the Mirror of God's Word. Um, this is on 1 John. Great book if you struggle with assurance of your salvation, uh, which a lot of people do. John has 20 tests. Uh, this uh, John has written, he, these things I've written that you might know for sure you have eternal life. And so he goes through a series of tests. Uh, also deals with the terrible heresy of Gnosticism, which by the way is in our churches today. And um, nothing new under the sun. It's just it's just bled, bread in a different way and has a different title. But um, so that's dealt with in, in 1 John. And then I took kind of the, just the 20 tests from that because there is so many, it seems as I go around and travel, a lot of women really struggle. They wonder about their salvation. Are they genuinely saved? And so I wrote a little booklet called 20 Little Tests for God's Little Children, or not 20 Little Tests, 20 Tests for God's Little Children, and they're not little tests, believe me. I, every once in a while I'll go through these making sure, you know, examining my own self to make sure that I'm in the faith even though uh, I'm 100% sure as much as I can be that I am, but I, as Paul says, he wants to beat his body into subjection, least he himself is a castaway, least he himself would go apostate. And so we want to always be examining ourselves. And so uh, there's 20 tests here for God's children. I go through each one of those in 1 John uh, and explain them. <clears throat> This is another little booklet that's great. If you're a pastor's wife or if you counsel or disciple, this little book, Helping Women Put Off Life-Dominating Sins, it deals with the top seven sins that women commit. Um, I deal with depression is not a sin, but it's the first thing that I usually see women in the counseling room for. So that's the first thing I deal with. Seven top sins women commit, seven biblical motivations for putting off sin, and then seven practical tips on how to put off sin in your life. So that's a very helpful little booklet in the back of it are also the 20 tests from 1 John along with all the tests in James. James also is a great book. If you want to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith for sure, read James, read 1 John and uh, that, should, that should answer it for you. I have a heart for discipleship as Nikki said and uh, every time somebody asks me I don't turn them down. I and uh, I was, I, I, when people say, how many women do you disciple? I go, I don't know, until I start looking at my contact list in my phone and then figure it out. But the Lord, this is really truly a love of my life, is to disciple. And um, I, I love discipleship. I love meeting with women. I love trying to help them in their walk with Christ. And so uh, this is an area that I think is really lacking in churches today where... 
I, I cannot tell you how many places I've been where there are young women and they say, there is no woman in this church that is willing to disciple me. I had one young girl, she was in a church of a thousand. She asked all three of her pastor's wives to either disciple her or help her find someone and they did not. And so finally she said, will you disciple me? And a church of a thousand, there has got to be a godly older woman. And so um, ladies, you, have, you that are gray headed like me, and uh, are you that are gray-haired and color your hair, but you're still gray? Uh, you need to be discipling. You need to be discipling. It's a command. In fact, I grabbed a lady in my church the other night, and I said, here's a new lady in our church. And I said, I'm really kind of to the brim right now. So uh, I said, you can pray about it, but it's a command from God. Old women are to teach young women. So Tuesday night, I grabbed her again. I said, well, what's your decision? She goes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I said, good. Because uh, you need to be obeying God and you're ready to disciple. So this deals with uh, who should disciple, when, where, how, and all. I give a lot of practical tips on discipleship. And then uh, call to scripture memory. I do love uh, to memorize God's word. And I share in this little booklet the technique uh, my husband shared with me when I met him over 41 years ago. Um, he had most of the New Testament memorized when I met him. And so uh, he's really the one that taught me his method. And uh, he's always teasing me when I throw those Bible verses at him. He says, I wish I'd never taught you to memorize scripture. <laughs> and uh, he's joking, of course. But anyway, um, this is my little journey on scripture memorization. Again, how do you do it, when, where, and all those questions are answered in that little booklet. So that's kind of what's out there. We also have a lot of CDs. Everything that I've ever taught on is on CD. Um, you can also download several things from my website to listen to. You can get on Worldview Weekend. I do a weekly Bible study for ladies on Worldview Weekend. Right now I'm teaching Ephesians on Worldview Weekend. This fall I will be teaching the Sermon on the Mount. That's an internet radio, www.worldviewweekend.com. And uh, so you can listen to that. You can download the homework from my website if you want to. A lot of churches will take the, the whatever I'm teaching on the radio and they will listen to that as a group of ladies and then download the homework from my website and do that in their Bible study. So you can do that as well. We have a lot of my teachings now on DVD. We have a lady in our church. I'll let you come get this. We have a lady in our church that, um, this is Debbie, and she is definitely such a blessing to me. So you want to meet her at least. But um, anyway... Um, we have a lady in our church that videos um, all my teachings on Tuesday night and puts them all together, and so she's in the process of getting all my teachings together. But we do have quite a few of them, few of them now on DVD. So, anyway, enough of all that. I am thankful. In fact, I was telling my husband the other day. I said, I can't believe we're going to celebrate our 40th. I said, I thought we, I didn't think we'd be married 40 years, and he said, Why not? And uh, I said, Because I didn't think you'd live that long. <laughs> Um, he's, you know, especially the, well, he's diabetic and the last five years, six years, he's had a couple of brushes with death and, uh, he's always like the fall I mentioned last night. This is like a common occurrence in our house. Now there's, I tell my son, I said, you know, every two or three months, something will go wrong with your dad. So that's just the way it is. But, um, I am thankful for a very godly husband. I, I so thankful for his headship and his encouragement, you know, he really does love me the way Christ loved the church. Um, he, one of the things that he has done is, is as men are commanded to study their wives and to know their wives. And he has pushed me all these years to excel in spiritually in my spiritual gifts. And he's not possessive. He is not jealous. And he wants me to be serving the Lord and using my, my gifts for the kingdom. And so I'm so thankful for him and um, am, am blessed by God to have a very godly man and one that knows the Bible better, really, than anybody I know living. So very thankful for him. And um, anyway, don't know how we got off on all that. but All right, well, let's get down to business. And uh, now we're, we're done at 1030, right, or before 1015 or something. Okay, well, this will be interesting. Can you get up here and rap with me? <laughs> I don't think I could do that now. I have four adopted children, grandchildren from Africa. They could probably do that. But um, anyway, well, let's pray and um, turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. For those of you that weren't here last night, I won't really go into where we're going. You know where we're going. You have an outline there. And uh, the first two sessions this morning are going to be on what to do in the fiery furnace. And last night we looked at five keys to loving life and... Uh, you can get that, I think, on a CD, they said, if you were not here last night. But for this morning, let's turn to First Peter 
chapter 4, verses 12 to 14, and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time, and I do thank you for your word. Lord, it is the delight of our heart, for we are called by your name, O God. And I pray that this morning that the words, your words would be more important to us than our necessary food. Lord, that we would find them and they would be sweet to our mouth, sweeter than honey. Father, I pray that we would digest them and that we would um, not just leave them there in our mind, but Lord, that we would take the things that are spoken in your word and that we would go and obey and do your word. Lord, James says, if any man is a hearer but not a doer, he has deceived himself into thinking that all he needs to really do is hear but not do anything about it. And that man or that woman has deceived themselves thinking they're a Christian when they're not. So God, I pray that we would be doers of your word and Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you this morning and say yes, Lord, to whatever it is that you would have us to do, that you might be glorified, that you might be exalted in this hour, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as you already know, I'm uh, from Oklahoma, even though I was born in Wisconsin, but I live in Tulsa area, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, when I tell people I'm from Oklahoma, there's usually a couple things that come to their mind. First of all is the musical, you know, oh, Oklahoma, where the... Da, 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 da. And, uh, or, you know, they talk, they talk about the federal building that was bombed. You know, that was a terrible tragedy when that happened. But one of the things about Oklahoma is we have these terrible tornadoes. And, in fact, we were hit by an F5 back in May of 2013 and done, did some terrible, I mean, just massive devastation. And Oklahoma is different than a lot of states in that we have a, a bad weather, even though you guys have your share of bad weather too. But, but uh, we do have terrific thunderstorms and tornado. We are known as Tornado Alley. And many of these storms that come into our city come very unexpected, especially tornadoes. The other night, Debbie and I were taking a gal out to dinner for her birthday in our church, and, and we were in a restaurant, and all the, everyone's cell phone was going off saying, tornado warning, get out, you know. And my husband called, and he said, Susan, get out of the restaurant, get home. And we had a 30-minute drive home, and the tornado was following us all the way. And that was really, uh, that was about the, the weirdest out I've been in a while. And Debbie said, I wonder if this is our time. And I said, well, it might be. We're going to be sucked up in this thing. <laughs> but, um, you know, in the spiritual realm, all of us as Christians have tornadoes, don't we, in our life? We have storms. Not, not physical, but we have spiritual storms. Much, as our, much of our life is filled with unexpected storms. Some storms come in the form of a mist, like a broken arm, my husband falling and breaking his elbow, a sick child, or a day in which everything goes wrong. We talked about that last night. Some storms come in the form of a steady rain, like a child who is sick for days and days and days, a betrayal by what you thought was your best friend, an unexpected move. Some of life's storms are a little more severe. They come in the form of thunderstorms, like an unfaithful husband, a rebellious child who leaves home, or a family member or a dear friend that gets sick and then dies. I think probably the most frightening of all life's storms are the tornadoes, the hurricanes of life. These storms perhaps might involve persecution for your faith. <laughs> or separation from a friend or a family member because of your stand for what Christ says and they reject you. Or maybe a catastrophe of some sort which affects your city or the world that you live in like the Supreme Court decision of June 26 that will forever change the course of the United States. Ladies, life is filled with storms, right? That's a fact. <laughs> but when the storms of life come into your world, what's usually the first thing that you ask the Lord? Why? <laughs> why is this happening to me, Lord? And ladies, sometimes we don't know why, and sometimes it's, we'll never know. We will never know. There's some things that have happened to me, I still don't know why. I have no idea why. But another question we should be asking, we don't often ask, but we need to be asking is how? How, Lord, do you want me to respond 
as I go through this storm of life. And ladies, my question to you this morning is, where do we go for the answer to the whys and the hows of life's storms? Where do we go? Well, for the believer in Jesus Christ, we go what? To his word, right? That's where we should be going. That's where we should be going. And I can think of no better place to land when we ask the question, why and how, than 1 Peter. Because as I mentioned last night, these Christians were going through storms that you and I cannot even imagine, at least not yet, even though I believe some of us in this room will face similar things. And so we're going to study this in this session and the session to follow and there are seven answers, you have an outline there, seven answers to the question, why? Why, Lord, is this happening? And then there are five answers to the how. How do you want me to respond? So let's read verses 12 through 14, where we're going to be in our time in this first session. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 14. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is sent to test you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of God and of glory resteth upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Now again, I want to remind you, these readers that are reading this epistle, their storms were different than ours, Okay. They're being killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Many of them have lost their homes. They're much like the group in Syria where they've been forced to flee their homes. They have no food. They have no shelter. Many of them are being killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. And yet, ladies, the message is still the same for us as it is to them, no matter what storm you are facing this morning. And so Peter begins by saying, Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is sent to test you. Ladies, it's a great comfort to me, and I hope it's a great comfort to you, and it's a great comfort to these readers that were living in that time that Peter begins by calling them beloved. You know what the term beloved means? It means loved ones. And it reminds these suffering Christians, and it reminds you and I that God loves us. He loves us. If you are called by his name, you are beloved. And so anything that he's allowing to happen in your life this morning is because he loves you. He loves you. And that love would help these Christians. It will help us go through any storm of life. Ladies, it helps you and I to know as we go through trials to know our Father loves us. One man said, what a sweet pillow upon which to rest our weary hearts just to know the Father loves us, end of quote. Well, after reminding them of the Father's love, Peter then reminds them, don't think your trials are strange. In fact, literally it reads, stop thinking it a thing alien to you. Don't think it's strange concerning this trial. Now, ladies, we need to understand the context, context here. The Gentile converts in this time would not be used to being persecuted for their faith in Christ. This would be something foreign to them. They would think it out of place and contrary to the blessing of being a Christian. In fact, you know, I've met people today that think the same thing. They think coming to Christ means health, wealth, prosperity, no worries. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> Did you consider the cost before you became a Christian? Jesus says, consider the cost. Hard is the way. It's hard. It's very hard. Ladies, Jesus already made it very clear. Attachment to his name would mean what? Persecution, hatred, we need to consider the cross. Jesus says, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. If you love the world, what? The world loves its own. They wouldn't hate you. <laughs> if they've persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Now, when Peter tells them, don't think it odd that they're going through fiery trials, the, the Greek tense is in the present imperative, which forbids, it forbids, ladies, listen very carefully, a puzzled, continued reaction of being shocked. You know what this tells me? When a trial comes into my life, if I remain in that state of like, whoa, why is this happening? Lord, when I keep on doing that, I'm sinning. 
Because Peter says, stop it. Stop doing that. Don't continue to be shocked at the trial that comes into your life. You know what happens if you do that? If you never accept the trial, the storm as a gift from your beloved Heavenly Father, you know what happens? You can't deal with the test. You start do taking drugs or whatever it is to deal with your situation, and you can't deal with it. In fact, in the 40 years that my husband has pastored, I have watched people go through trials for long periods of time, and I wonder, how come they're not able to accept this? How come they can't accept this trial as a gift from the Lord? How come they're not in church anymore? Where, what's happening to them? They struggle, they fight against God. And yet, I have to tell you that in the, those same 40 years, I've watched other believers in Jesus Christ receive storms of life from the Heavenly Father that I can't even imagine myself going through. And I'm encouraged by watching them and wonder, Susan, could you respond like they have responded if God were to give you that trial? <laughs> and their faith and their strength encourages me. So, ladies, the number first answer to why, why is this happening, Lord? It's a promise. <laughs> Isn't that what Peter says? Don't be surprised by the strange trial that's come to test you. It's a promise. It's to be expected. It's part of the course you enrolled in when you signed up to be a Christian. Did you think about that? You know, some of us don't consider the cost, but nonetheless, it's a part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. In fact, I heard about a father whose son was killed in a car wreck, and at the funeral, he went up to the pastor, and he said this. He said, I want to know, where was God when my son was killed? And the pastor turned to him and he said, the same place he was when his son was killed. Ladies, God is still on the throne. And we must not forget that as we go through trials. It's a part of life, right? It's a part of life. Now, notice Peter calls these trials fiery. What does that mean? Well, the word fiery means a burning or a furnace, something that is ignited. In fact, the particular Greek word is used only here and in Revelation, where it talks about Babylon's destruction, and it calls it the smoke of her burning. And so many people believe this is a literal burning. It's a real, real fire. And it, that's possibly very true, because remember, many of them, as I mentioned last night, they were being rolled in pitch or tar and then set to light. They were set to fire to be lit for Nero's gardens at night. I just got finished reading a book by J.C. Uh, Ryle called in, I think somebody in old times, talking about those that were burned at the stake during the time of Queen Mary. And, you know, actually some of them, they would be, be burning and their arms would fall off and parts of their body would fall off while they were still living. And they would still be begging people to repent. So it could be literal when he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial because many of them were being burned to death. But not all of them were being burned to death. So it could refer to being tested by fire, as Peter says, the fiery trials which are sent to test you. In fact, in 1 Peter 1, 7, he's already talked, talked to them about being tested as by fire. And he refers to it there in 1 Peter 1, 7 as a refining process that gold goes through where it's melted and this hot, hot fire until all the impurities are skimmed off and then you have left this pure gold. You know, that's what Job says. He says, I know that he knows the way that I've taken. And when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. And ladies, Job went through a trial that you and I can't even imagine going through. Losing all your kids, losing everything you own, having a, a lovely wife that tells you to curse God and die. I mean, having sores all over your body. And yet he says, he knows the way I take. And when he's finished testing me, I'll come forth as gold. I'll come forth as gold. The psalmist says, for you, O God, you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You know, we might say today, boy, she's really going through a fiery trial. <laughs> fiery trial. So the second answer to why, why, Lord, is this happening? There's a purpose. It's to test you. Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial which is sent to 
test you. In fact, the word for try means here in the Greek to try you for probation or a putting to the proof. Trying to see if you are genuine. Ladies, God wants to test us to see if we're real. He wants to test us. He wants to purify the sin out of our life. Will I persevere? Will I deny the Lord? You know, the storms of life really show what we are made of, don't they? Aren't they? I think as we as women go through the trials of life, it really shows who we really are. It shows who we really are. Are we really leaning on the everlasting arms? Are we really a child of the king? Are we leaning on our own strength? Have I been faking it all these years, telling people I'm a Christian, but then God decides to put me through a fiery trial and I, I cater? Ladies, these things come out as we go through the trials of life. Well, Peter goes on to repeat what he just said. He says, don't think it's some strange thing that happened to you. (laughs) Ladies, why do we think trials are foreign to believers? Why do we think God has promised us a life of ease and comfort? In fact, the Greek here is, it's a strong Greek word that means God forbid. God forbid that you would ever think that it's strange that he would try you or test you. Ladies, nothing just happens in the life of a believer. Nothing just happens. Nothing. Persecution and suffering is not an accident. It's all part of God's divine plan for your life. He appoints our days, our times, everything. He knows even when you're going to die. You know, I was talking to a gal the other day. I was discipling. She says, you know, I don't know worry, why I worry about all that stuff. He, she says, God has an appointment for me, and he, he knows when it's going to be. He's not going to take me one minute before he's ready for me. He knows all that. So instead of spending time sitting around thinking it's strange that you're being tested with a trial, notice what Peter says in verse 13. <laughs> he says, but, which is a contrast, but rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. In fact, there's two words for but in the Greek. One is day, one is Allah. This is the stronger Greek word, (laughs) the strongest of the two. So instead of sitting around thinking, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Lord, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? (laughs) You say no, but you rejoice. So here's your first answer to how. How, Lord, do you want me to go through this trial that I'm going through this morning? He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to rejoice. And the Greek word there means be cheerful. He wants you to be cheerful. In fact, you know Peter's going to mention four times about the joy that we should have in the next two verses as we go through trials. He uses words like rejoice, be glad, be exceedingly joyful, be happy, (laughs) be blessed. Now, ladies, when's the last time that you were presented with a fiery trial and you were rejoicing? In fact, the Greek indicates here it's not a one-time rejoicing, but it's a continued attitude of rejoicing as you go through this trial. Why? Why should I rejoice? Peter says, notice what he says, because we're partakers of Christ's suffering. Because we are a partaker of Christ's suffering. One man says this, faith realizes that the ground for rejoicing does not lie in the suffering themselves, but in the fellowship with Christ that they bring. I was talking to a pastor's wife while I go out in the lobby, and she was telling me about one of her years. It was bad. She lost a great friend. She lost a baby. And I said, yeah, but I bet you grew very close to the Lord. And she said, I did. I did. That sweet, sweet fellowship that we have as we go through the sufferings. So, ladies, this would be number three on the why of suffering. Why do we suffer? so that we can be a partaker of his sufferings, so that we can be a partaker of his sufferings. And notice Peter says something very interesting. He says, to the extent, which means in so much or in so far as in the measure of. What Peter is saying is, listen very carefully, All the readers of this epistle had not been called to the same degree of suffering. And ladies, you haven't either. Some of you in this room are going to go through trials that you can't even imagine. It's it's good that God doesn't show us the 
the rest of our life, right? Because we might be one of those last night that we talked about that try to commit suicide. But um, some of you in this room are going to go through trials that you can't even imagine. And yet some of the, you in this room are going to just probably go through life and have very few trials. Now, why God calls some of us to suffer more than others, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that question. But I have this. I have seen in my almost 60 years now those that he calls to suffer in a great degree. They are the ones that I think are some of the most godly believers that I know of. Steadfast in their faith. I mean, you mentioned last night Elizabeth Elliot. Now, there's a woman who's gone through a lot of suffering. But you know what? She was steadfast to the end. And through those sufferings, she was refined as gold. In fact, if you haven't looked at her funeral, I, I wanted to get there, but I had my seven grandchildren, so I didn't get to her funeral. But it's very interesting. You can YouTube it and watch it. Very, just like her. You know, she's laying there in a pine box, and, you know, it's open. You can see her body, and this is a very simple funeral, but it's very honoring to the Lord. There's a woman that suffered but gave her much grace. But ladies, it doesn't really matter. If God gives you a lot of trials, great. If he gives you a few, great too. Whatever degree of suffering he calls you to do, it will allow you to partake in his sufferings, his pain, which means to share in close fellowship with him. Paul mentions in Philippians 129, for it is given unto you in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his name. You know, we like the belief part, right? Yeah, I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But Paul says that's not only a gift, but suffering's a gift, right? Now, I have to say, I didn't ask for my 40th wedding anniversary from my husband. Honey, could you give me the gift of suffering for our 40th anniversary? Even though he says, you know, Susan, we said for better and worse, and you got the worst. That's what he's always telling me. You got the worst. But Peter says suffering's a gift. Paul says suffering is a gift. It's a gift. Remember what Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. Why? So that I might be made conformable to his death. I want to identify with Christ in his sufferings. Ladies, Paul's desire was to identify with the Lord so much he wanted to suffer <laughs> so that he could understand what his Lord went through. You might say, why would anybody want to do that? Are they crazy? Well, I remember many, many years ago that that really hit home to me for the first time in my life. My husband and I had some dear friends. They were our best friends. We did everything together. Our kids did everything together. And some things came to our attention, and we had to confront them on a sin issue. And they went south, and we lost the friendship over it. My husband and I didn't sleep, eat for two weeks. I would go to bed at night and just... Stare at the ceiling. Couldn't believe this is one of those times I, I should have remembered First Peter. Don't continue to be surprised. And, uh, but I was young then, probably, probably 30-ish, something around there. But um, I, for the first time in my life, I thought, Lord, that's what that means. I can identify that when Peter denied you, when Judas betrayed you. And, you know, for the first time, I could say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now I know a little bit of what it was like when all the disciples forsook you and fled. And I could say, thank you, thank you. My friends, suffering allows us to identify with the Lord. Do you want to know him? You know, we, we like to sing these worship songs, yeah, I want to know you, and rah, rah, Jesus. But, you know, and you have those tingly, you know, goosebumps and all that, but do you want to know him in the suffering? In suffering? It's a privilege. It's a gift. In fact, Paul says something even more crazy. If you think Philippians is crazy, Colossians 124. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. You know what Paul says? I'm pursuing a course of life which will cause me to suffer so that I can fill up what, it, what is lacking in my life in suffering. I want to identify with Christ so much. No wonder we, as we read those lists last night, you know, beaten 40 times and, or, or three times, he was beaten, you know, 40 stripes and he was out in the middle of the sea naked. And I mean, this guy was crazy, you know, but he wanted to identify with his, he loved the Lord. No wonder Paul can come to Romans and say, I wish that I could go to hell for my kinsmen. 
I mean, ladies, have you thought through that passage? I would go to hell for you. I, I am sorry, I'm not there yet. I'm not Paul. I know there's no spiritual giants. I agree with Paul Washer, but I'm not there with my brother Paul. I mean, I, I want to go to be with my Lord. I, I'm, I don't know that I could go to hell for anybody, but Paul, he wanted to pursue such that course so he could know the Lord. And ladies, that should be the desire of all of us. Now, notice Peter's not saying to rejoice in the suffering. Look very carefully. He's not saying rejoice in the suffering in verse 13, but rejoice because you can share in Christ's sufferings. Now, I have known people that like trials, and you know why? Because they want attention. They want everybody to feel sorry for them. They want to tell their stories. You know, they want people to bring them meals. They want to be pampered. Ladies, that is not godly. That is selfish, and it's wicked. <laughs> it's wicked. But Peter says, no, we, so we can share in his sufferings. The motive behind the rejoicing is the blessing of identifying with Christ. Not so that somebody will feel sorry for you and bring you flowers and candy. Part of the blessings of partaking in his sufferings includes partaking in the results of his sufferings. Notice what Peter says. He puts it this way. That when his glory is revealed, you'll be glad with exceeding joy. Ladies, when Christ is revealed in glory, we're going to share in his glory. Just as we've shared in his sufferings. What Peter is saying here, that present rejoicing now during our trials prepares us to fully experience joy in the future in glory. Paul says, if we endure, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. Peter goes on to say, We'll be glad with exceeding joy. You know what? This is a great burst of joy that will sweep over us at Christ's return. In fact, exceeding would include jubilation, skipping, and bubbling over with shouts of delight. <laughs> now, ladies, I know that's going to be a divine intervention for some of you people. <laughs> you know, some Reformed churches I go to are about the deadest I've ever seen. I don't know. It's going to be really hard for them to skip and be joyful when they get to heaven. <gasps> and that will be a divine intervention for sure. But that's what Peter's saying. You will have exceeding joy. I know some of you, you know, you squelch all those emotions, but when you get to heaven, that's not going to happen because you're going to be in your glorified body. In fact, the present tense here of the exceeding joy is enduring forever because it's forever and ever. We're going to be with him forever and ever. Exceeding joy. You'll be glad. You'll be glad. Number two on the answer to how to respond in trials is this. Rejoice knowing that glory is going to follow. Rejoice in your trial right now. Why? Because glory is to follow, ladies. Do you know life's trials are going to seem small when we see Christ? It is not going to matter. It's not going to matter what the Supreme Court did. It's not going to matter that, you know, Bruce Jenner's now okay. It's not going to matter. Even all that stuff is just nauseating. It's not going to matter. Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 4, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Well, Peter continues with his theme of being happy in trials. Notice what he says in verse 14. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. <laughs> for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The word if is not really if, it means since. Or in view of the fact that you are reproached for the name of Christ. In fact, being reproached for the name of Christ means to be insulted. And so this would include attacks that were verbal or physical. We've all been there. I had an unbelieving family member one time and she was hemorrhaging and she thought she might die. My husband and I drove all night in the middle of the night to go see her. And, and she told me later, she said, I was praying if you were coming here to confront me that God would kill you on the way. I was like, whoa, you know. And uh, this is just some of the stuff, you know. And so we've been there where people have physically and verbally attacked us. We've all been there. And Peter says, if you're reproached because of your attachment to Christ, what? Rejoice, rejoice. 
Peter says in verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Peter says if you're attacked physically or verbally, you're happy, you're blessed, you're spiritually well off. That's a great deal. Woe if all men speak well of you. Isn't that what Jesus said? In fact, my husband has been attacked so many times. In, I mean, he's had people want to kill him. And literally, we had one elder come to our door in our first church with a gun, ready to kill him. And so, I mean, he, and he's always saying, this is great. This is great. And uh, I remember the first, one of the first times I went with him to speak at one of his former churches that he attended when he was growing up. And he was speaking on Titus too. And one of the ladies afterwards, you know, came up in the receiving line and she said, oh, I hate you and I hate that message. And I'm like, oh. And he goes, isn't this great? And I go, no, it's awful. <laughs> what are you talking about? Now I'm, you know, I've been a little bit longer in the faith. I'm, yeah, bring it on. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Rejoice. Rejoice, he says, and be exceedingly glad. glad. Why? For great is your reward in heaven. And so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ladies, read the Old Testament. Look at the persecution of the prophets that went before us and the apostles and the disciples. That should encourage us. Why should we be happy, Peter says? Why should we be blessed? Peter says, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. In fact, the word rest here is an interesting Greek word, which means to refresh. The spirit refreshes you. In fact, it speaks of a farmer resting his land by sowing light crops on it. He relieves the land of the necessity of producing heavy crops and therefore gives it an opportunity to rest. Remember in Leviticus 25, it talks about that. You know, you harvest your stuff for six years, and then what do you do on the seventh year? In Leviticus, I know all of you have Leviticus memorized by now. <clears throat> Who's going to take that book up that we talked about if we all go to prison? <clears throat> but remember in Leviticus, it says six years, you do that, and then on the seventh, you what? You let it rest. Why? So it can recuperate and be refreshed. That's a, the Greek idea here. So the idea is that the indwelling Holy Spirit, as we go through suffering, he rests and he refreshes us, even though the world is persecuting us. One man said he rests upon the Christian as the Shekinah rested on the tabernacle and brings a foretaste of that glory which is fully given at the revelation. Ladies, he, strengthen us, he strengthens us beyond our understanding. You've been there. I've been there. If you're walking with the Lord, you've been there. You've, you've, persecute, you've been persecuted. You've suffered for Christ. And you go, how come I'm feeling so great, you know, just refreshed about this? It's not you. It's the Spirit. In fact, this is probably the idea in Matthew chapter 4. Remember when the devil came to test Jesus over and over and over and over? It says when the devil left him that angels came and ministered to him. They refreshed him. Also in Acts, we see this when Stephen was being persecuted for his attachment to Christ. It said that they looked at his, his face as he was looking into heaven, and it, it looked like a face of an angel. I mean, they're stoning uh, Stephen with stones like this. I mean, not little pebbles, big old stones in there. You know, throwing them at him. He's probably about gashes coming out of his body and bleeding everywhere. And he's just like, oh. he's refreshed. He's strengthened. And ladies, it is for many of you, you could testify that. Just like Christ, Stephen, they were refreshed and strengthened by the Spirit. You've been there too. I remember one lady told me when um, her son was in a car wreck, he, he was, um, his car hydroplaned and his best friend in the front seat was killed. And um, this was, uh, she's now an elder's wife in our church, but I spent many hours up at the hospital with her and we didn't know if her son was going to live or die, and that's probably been 10 years ago now. But she said, Susan, she said, I had an aware of Christ's presence that I've never had. And she said, I, I, I long for that. I miss it. I miss that. The Holy Spirit strengthening and refreshing. There's a closeness with our Father that we don't have at other times. But as we go through suffering, he strengthens us. And so we have a third answer when asking the question, how do I respond to life's storms? How do I do this? With assurance, knowing the Holy Spirit will strengthen and refresh me. With assurance, knowing the Holy Spirit will strengthen and refresh me. 
Paul says, most gladly, I glory in my infirmities. Why? So the power of Christ will rest on me. <laughs> I glory in my infirmities. Bring them on. Why? So the power of Christ will rest on me. And then Peter ends these words in verse 14. On their part, he's blasphemed, but on your part, he's glorified. This phrase here is not in the original manuscripts, but if it were in the original manuscripts, what Peter is saying is basically this. They, the persecutors, blaspheme God, but you, on the other hand, on your part, by your life, he is glorified. So, why do we have storms in this life? First of all, it's a promise. It's to be expected. Do you expect trials? Do you see them as part of your being a child of God? Are you under the myth that trials are not for believers? Secondly, there's a purpose to test you. What trials have you encountered in the past year, the past week, or even today? How have they been used by God to bring you one step closer to his image? Thirdly, we have trials in order to allow us to be a partaker or to participate in Christ's sufferings. Is this a comfort to you to be able to fellowship with Christ in his sufferings? Secondly, how do we respond to difficulties? First of all, with an attitude of rejoicing. Is this your response to trials that God allows? Now, I understand it might not be the immediate response. When my husband fell a few weeks ago and I realized how significant his injuries were, I can't say, oh, this is so right yeah, you know I, I but again but as the morning went on I I was at peace this is what God wants for me today you might not be able to respond immediately with joy but eventually you have joy knowing that God is doing something valuable in your life for your good secondly we are to rejoice knowing that glory is to follow when life hits you with a trial, do you let your mind drift to heaven and what is to come, which is glory? <laughs> do life's trials seem small to you compared to eternity and seeing Christ? And lastly, we respond with an attitude of assurance, knowing the Holy Spirit will strengthen and refresh in us. How did the Spirit strengthen and refresh in you in your last trial? Well, I know many of you are facing storms of life today. For some of you, it might be a mist. Some of you, a steady rain. Some of you are going through thunderstorms. Some of you are going through tornadoes and hurricanes. But ladies, whatever type of trial God's allowing, whether small or great, will you allow it to bring you closer to the Master as he walks with you through the fiery furnace? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in your word. I, I look forward to completing what Peter shares with the readers, these persecuted Christians, our brothers and sisters that are now with you. And I pray, Lord, that you will use um, this session and the one to follow to encourage my sisters here as they go through the sufferings of this life, whether they're trials or persecutions for being attached to you. I pray that you will use these words to encourage them that you would be glorified through them in Christ's name. Amen.